This video is about stellar aberration, the apparent movement of the position of the stars in the sky as a result of the motion of the Earth going round the Sun. It's an interesting case of the application of the scientific method. Observations were made to confirm a scientific theory, in this case it was a heliocentric theory, and to measure an effect, in this case it was stellar parallax, but unexpected results were found and these in turn led to new discoveries. The story started back in 1727 when the English astronomer James Bradley had been taking measurements of the position of El Tannin, the brightest star in the constellation of Draco, the dragon. So what Bradley was looking for was a small shift in the position of El Tannin, known as the parallax, and that's what I'm going to talk you through briefly now. So if we start in December, the direction of the star is shown by the purple line. And then if you go forward three months to March, then the star's apparent position has shifted. And then if we go forward another three months to June, then the apparent position of the star has shifted again. And then once again to September, you can see it has shifted again. Over the course of a year, the star, El Tannin, should trace out a small circle centred on its mean position. In this diagram, the position shift is greatly exaggerated, of course. The position shift Bradley was looking for was very small, which is why it hadn't been detected before. And of course, a star doesn't need to be at a right angle to the plane of the Earth's orbit, which is called the ecliptic, to show a parallax any angle will do. In Bradley's time, the heliocentric theory in which the Earth and all the planets orbit the Sun was generally accepted by pretty much all astronomers. But even so, it hadn't been accepted by the Catholic Church, and many thinkers outside the field of astronomy still believed in the older geocentric theory in which the Sun and planets orbit the Earth. Finding the parallax of a star would confirm that the heliocentric theory was correct and it would also allow the distances to the stars to be calculated. And this diagram shows how you do it. Just from simple trigonometry, the distance to the star, which I've given the symbol DSS, is equal to the distance between the Earth and Sun, which was known in Bradley's time, divided by the tangent of the parallax angle, which Bradley hoped to measure. So, just to recap, the position shift due to parallax, which Bradley expected as the Earth goes round the Sun, is shown again. However, the position shift Bradley observed is shown here. And as you can see, although El Tannin did move in a circle, its position shift was different than if parallax were the cause. In trying to explain his observations, Bradley discovered an entirely different effect, which became called stellar aberration. And as I'll explain next, Bradley's discovery not only confirmed the heliocentric theory as being correct, but also allowed an accurate measurement of the speed of light. To understand the cause of stellar aberration, let's consider a rainy day where there's no wind. Rain falls vertically from the sky. However, if you're moving, rain no longer appears to fall vertically, but is tilted in your direction of travel. And two common examples of this, which will be familiar to most people, are that if you're carrying an umbrella and walking quickly, then you need to tilt your umbrella in a forward direction to shield from the rain. And also, if you've been on a train, when the train is moving, looking at the window, rain appears to streak down the window diagonally. Bradley reasoned that the change in the star's position 
which became known as stellar aberration, was due to the speed of the Earth's motion around the Sun. He believed that light consisted of small particles which travelled at a finite speed, and these light particles appear displaced in the direction the Earth was moving. In the same way, raindrops are when a person is moving. Bradley was able to show that to a very good approximation, the aberration angle, which we'll call theta, for a star at an angle A to the Earth's motion is given by the tangent of theta equals minus V over C times the sine A. And observations have proven this formula to be correct. The negative sign arises because the star is displaced towards the direction of the Earth's motion. A dash is smaller than A. If you want to see any more information on how this formula was derived, then have a look at the link on my Explaining Science blog page. So, as we've seen previously, as the Earth goes round its orbit, the direction in which it's moving is continually changing. And so, the displacement of a star from its mean position due to aberration has to continually change too. If we take an example, Let's consider a star which is at right angles to the Earth's orbit. We call this location the ecliptic pole. And as you can see from the diagram, the star is always at 90 degrees to the direction which the Earth is moving around the Sun. So the angle A in the formula is always 90 degrees. And because the sine of 90 degrees is 1, tan theta is simply minus V divided by the speed of light c, which comes out as 9.94 times 10 to the minus 5. This means that theta is minus 20.5 arc seconds. This is a very small angle, roughly 1 the diameter of how big the moon appears in the sky. So stars should then move in a circle of radius 20.5 arc seconds, very small circles. In reality, they don't because the Earth's velocity around the Sun varies a little. It's faster when it's closer to the Sun and slower when it's further away. So Bradley's remarkable observations not only confirm the heliocentric theory as being correct, but also allowed the determination of C, the speed of light. And if you look at this, you see that um, tan theta is approximately equal to minus V over C sine A, where theta is the aberration angle. We've talked about this, and that's what Bradley measured. V is the Earth's velocity around the sun, and that was known to Bradley. It varies between 29.3 kilometers a second in July and 20 and 30.3 kilometers per second in January when the Earth is closest to the Sun. A is the angle between the star and the Earth's direction of motion. Again, that was known. So with those three known quantities, Bradley was to work out from this equation that C, the speed of light, is 301,000 kilometers a second. That's in today's units. And this is actually remarkably within a half a percent of the correct value. So far, the examples we've talked about have been where the star is at right angles to the plane of the Earth's orbit. This diagram shows the stellar aberration of a star which lies in the same plane as the Earth's orbit, the ecliptic. And in this case, imagine we're looking down from above on the Earth's orbit. So if we start in December, the Earth is moving at 90 degrees to the direction of the star. So the aberration is at its maximum, minus V over C. Let's go forward a bit to early February. The Earth is now moving at 45 degrees to the direction of the star. So the aberration is now smaller the star is displaced a smaller amount from its mean position. Moving forward again to March, the Earth is now moving directly towards the star. So the aberration is now zero and the star 
isn't displaced at all. In June, the Earth is moving at 90 degrees to the star's position. So the star is, has its maximum position shift minus V over C. And in September, the Earth is now moving directly away from the star. So the aberration is now zero and the star isn't displaced at all. So as you can see, the star traces out a straight line path over the course of a year. Bradley, like many 18th century physicists, believed in a particle theory of light. In the 19th century, however, a wave theory of light became generally accepted. The wave theory is better able to explain phenomena such as diffraction and interference patterns. However, when this theory was tried to apply to aberration of starlight, it ran into a couple of difficulties. Firstly, the aberration angle theta varies with the speed of light c. In the wave theory, light travels more slowly in air than it does in vacuum, but the difference is small. In a denser medium, the slowing is actually quite significant. So when light passes through water, for instance, it travels 1.3 times more slowly than it does in a vacuum. So if we filled a telescope with water, the aberration angle ought to be 1.3 times larger than if it's filled with air. This water-filled telescope experiment was first performed by George Airy back in 1871 and no difference was observed. Secondly, 19th century wave theory of light required that light travel in a medium which was given the name the ether. This was an invisible material which had no interaction with any physical objects and the speed of light was measured with respect to this ether. So for stellar aberration to work, the sun would have to be stationary with respect to the ether, which even to 19th century physicists seemed unlikely. It's actually worth pointing out here also that Bradley's theory, although it matches observations perfectly well made with an air-filled telescope, the aberration angle would be different in this theory when viewed through a water-filled telescope. Today, the generally accepted explanation of stellar aberration is by Einstein's theory of special relativity. In special relativity, there's no absolute space. As the Earth moves around the Sun, we are observing the star in different reference frames. And each of these reference frames, the star has a slightly different position due to the difference in relative motion of the Earth with respect to the star. However, the shift in position predicted by special relativity almost exactly matches Bradley's theory. The shift in position of a nearby star caused by parallax, which Bradley had been looking for, is much smaller than that due to stellar aberration. It wasn't successfully measured until 1838, when the German astronomer Friedrich Bessel found it for the star 61 Cygni. The parallax he measured was 0.314 arc seconds and that's 65 times smaller than the shift due to stellar aberration. It's the angle subtended by an object of diameter two centimeters, so that's something like a American one cent or British one pence coin at a distance of 13 kilometers. So because parallax was so difficult to detect, even by the year 1900, only 60 nearby stars had had their parallax measured. And it wasn't until the development of machines to accurately measure the positions of stars on photographic plates, which didn't come till later in the 20th century, 
that a large number of parallaxes were calculated. Well, I hope you've enjoyed watching this short video. Just to wrap up, I thought I would summarize the differences between stellar aberration and stellar parallax. So the first difference is um, stellar aberration is caused by the change in direction of the Earth's motion as it orbits the sun. Parallax is caused by the change in the Earth's position as it orbits the sun. Stellar aberration was first detected in 1727, more than 100 years before stellar parallax. And although Bradley was the first person to accurately measure and explain stellar aberration, a small shift in position of stars over a 12 month cycle had been reported by earlier astronomers. In fact, interestingly, the first ever British astronomer royal, John Flamsteed, but none of these earlier astronomers have been able to accurately measure the effect nor provide a satisfactory account for it. Stellar aberration doesn't vary with the distance of the star, just, pretends, just depends on the position of the star in the sky. Stellar parallax um, varies inversely with the distance. Near objects have a bigger parallax. And finally, um, Stellar aberration is a much larger effect, um, still very small, but a larger effect than stellar parallax. Um, even the closest um, star, Proxima Centauri, the um, stellar parallax is still about um, 25, 30 times smaller than stellar aberration.